Okay, good afternoon, welcome back. As usual, I posted the lesson plans and the presentations for the present week, which is week nine of the semester. We're going to talk, discuss about the themes in general of a motor car divorce from 1906, possibly read and analyze some passages from it and we'll continue with the analysis through the first part of next week. On Thursday, I will go back to the activity we initiated last Thursday about the final project and review with you the comments, the ideas you had after looking at some samples of documents for possible inclusion in the final project. This to discuss the parameters, the format, the methodology of the project itself. The assignments are just reading the last set of readings from Louis Glosser Hale's A Motor Car Divorce, which is a longish novel, certainly longer than a lightning, the lightning conductor. <clears throat> I posted an announcement about the uh, assignments explaining why I'm taking so long so go and read it. Let's talk about the author briefly. There she is. She was born in Chicago in 1872, attended two drama schools, one in New York and one in Boston. She went into theater. She became famous as a character actress which would be the typical actress that plays a strong supporting role in a play or a film. She was very active in cinema during the 1900s, especially the 1910s and 20s. In fact, during the 1920s, she moved to California. At that point, she was a widow, she had lost her husband, who was also an actor, but an artist as well, and an illustrator, a writer, etc. And she went on to play in silent films, then sound films until 1933. I've included a link to a YouTube video where you can see her in her last movie, Dinner at Eight. In 1933, she had a heart attack and died uh, at the age of 60, before her 61st birthday. You can find some mementos from her time. This is her casting picture, the picture, the photograph that at some point her agent would uh, circulate uh, for to to find uh, engagements contracts for him, and there is this famous door from New York City where actors and actresses from the 1900s would sign their name, and she's also there. She was very active on the New York scene, and also. The entrance. You can read her short, the short version of her biography on Wikipedia if you want to. You don't have to know the details. And uh, you have a longer biography entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I've included a link to explain what a character actress does and a few other things. She became, she became really famous around 1903, playing a part in Candida by Bernard Shaw, Bernard Shaw. the last name Shaw has been dropped from there, I have to add it. The play was so famous that the New York Times talked about Candida mania, that everyone in New York was talking about this show 
People who had seen it were talking about what they had seen, and people who were going to see it were talking about the experience they were going to have. Because of this success, she also toured in Europe. She worked in London several times on different shows, and it was during one of the periods she spent in London with her husband that they took a car and drove through Europe and did the actual travel, the actual journey that is documented, that is the basis of the novel, A Motor Car Divorce. And in fact, I uh, uh, have recently completed a translation of the novel from English into Italian with footnotes, and whenever I checked about references to not only places, but also hotels or inns where the characters of John Ward and Peggy are staying in the novel, most of the time there were real places that existed during the time. And I, I, I don't think we, we have enough evidence to think that they actually visited the places themselves and probably from the notes that she took during that trip, the idea came out of writing a novel, especially at a time where motor romance of different kinds were becoming popular. I've added a few quotes about describing her husband from a magazine from the time, The Bookman. The Bookman is the same magazine where the motor car divorce was first published in a series of installments before it came out as a book. And as I said, he died in 1917 and, and she continued on with her career. She played in roughly 30 films between silent films and <coughs> films with sound. She also wrote about 10 books some of them are simply chronicles of the uh, journeys made by her and her husband with an automobile in other places, but they're not fictional accounts of those journeys. They're more like cultural accounts with some personal experiences, anecdotes, funny short episodes, together with informative content about the history of the places they visited. He wrote a few novels, a few other novels, for example, The Actress in 1909, which is the story of a young actress who's not married, who's being courted by a wealthy man, um, sl only slightly older than she is, in New York City. Uh, and, and uh, she doesn't want to commit to that relationship. She accepts a job in London, a contract to uh, um, be part of a production of a play in London through the summer, exactly to remove herself from that situation because the man is very pressing, is insisting on her uh, getting engaged to him and in London, she has a few dalliances, not affairs, because of course, everything is very Victorian or neo-Victorian. You barely find a few kisses, but barely, and, and possibly no more than two or three through the entire novel. But the romantic experiences she has in London are not satisfying and finally he travels to London and they uh, get together after the typical misunderstandings, right? She's convinced that she's having a full-blown relationship with uh, an Englishman, which is not exactly uh, the case. And, and she herself has been thinking about him with some uh, nostalgia. There is another semi-autobiographical novel she wrote about a young woman, a teenager, who lives a small town in the Midwest to go and live in New York in a pension uh, that is renting room for uh, women, women, single women. And in New York, 
she's attending a school similar to the kind of uh, theater uh, academy that uh, um, Louise herself uh, attended. And there too, you have a few uh, romantic relationships which are mostly based on court and not on the consummation of the relationship uh, and, and great emphasis on uh, the dangers uh, that the, the honor of, of this young woman uh, is exposed to in a big city such as New York City. By far, the motor car divorce is the best novel and uh, if the other novels and books were successful, it was at least in part based on the success of this 1906 book. And also, of course, the fact that she was well known as an actress from theaters and from the film she did. So let me summarize briefly the story in the novel, which has been uh, assigned already with plenty of ex excerpts because it's difficult to reduce it to just a few episodes and then we'll go through the list of uh, keywords and ideas that I posted in this presentation. So at the beginning of the novel entitled The Motor Car Divorce we find Peggy who is a young woman of about 28, 28 or 29, who's married to John Ward, who's uh, uh, 10 years older. Uh, so she got married young and uh, got engaged with John at 17 or 18. During the first two pages, she tells you briefly about the start of this relationship, how she was considered to be a brat and, and spoiled brat at that by her mother who sent her to a poorer aunt, Aunt Jane, to visit her. And during this visit, she met John and John fell in love with her and John courted her and uh, they quickly got married. Peggy tells the reader how she has been working on herself and broadening her view. And uh, she mentions the changes that are occurring in society, in the technological field, such as the introduction of the automobile, and in general, for example, issues of social mobility, issues of feminism, she refers to it with the label that was assigned at the time at the movement, which is the new woman, the new woman movement. And in order to be aligned with these developments in society, Peggy, who's not working because her husband is a professional in the area of marketing, um, and, and they live comfortably, they have a house in New Jersey, they have staff at the house, they have servants. So in order to keep herself occupied and also in line with the trendiest fashions and practices in society, among other things, Peg uh, frequents uh, a uh, female-only club in New York called the Minerva Club. In there, they talk about marriage and in particular, according to Peggy, during the first chapter, once they discuss, they start a series, a long series of discussions about the proposal that just a few years earlier, keep in mind that the trip, as it happened in real life, the trip to Italy and France done by the author to place either in 1902 or 1903, so around the same time, a British author who was also nominated for the Nobel Prize made a proposal called a 10 years clause, suggesting that couples should include in their marriage contract a clause establishing that the 
marriage should be automatically annulled after 10 years and the two members of the couple be allowed to go on their own ways if they so desire. Keep in mind there was of course divorce in England, in the United States at that time. Of course the procedure for divorce was a bit more involved than it is now. It particularly involved the um, introduction of proper justification. That is to say, there were instances when a judge could and would refuse to uh, um, approve the, the, his uh, approval of their approval of the uh, marriage dissolution, uh, not finding grounds for it. So uh, Peggy, of course, who's always trying to uh, be fashionable, be cool, reflect the trends that she picks up in society and being seen as someone who's changing herself, someone who's growing. Although very much of this, a lot of this is theater, is, is appearances. She not only supports the idea of the 10 year clause, but, one of, but when one of the members of the Minerva Club calls on her saying, why don't you do something about it? She says, well, I'll show you. I'm about to do that with myself, with my husband. I'll, I'll myself get divorced because it's been 10 years. And she goes home and uh, uh, she talks about it uh, to her husband. Her husband doesn't really think that she wants to uh, be divorced, uh, but uh, she allows to this to go on, plans be made, um, because he thinks that uh, this is like a game for, for Peg, right? And all of this is narrated through the irony of the author. And keep in mind, one of the most essential prerequisites for the understanding of the novel is that Peggy's voice, what she says about herself, her thoughts, her feelings, what she does, etc., are not what the author, Louise Glosser Hale, thinks or feels. Clearly, this is an older woman by the standards of the time when the book was published. Uh, she would have been 34, a mature woman at that anyway, who is presenting an ironic portrayal of young woman, women, young American women from large urban areas such as in your city who want to be fashionable, who want to be trendy, who want to be seen as cool. So keep in mind that often the entire novel is told through the voice of Peg, but often there is irony that is directed at Peg herself, right? And it's like a more mature woman, Louise, the author, making fun of a less mature, more immature woman, and making fun of, of this strong desire to project a public persona, an identity that is scaffolded, that is supported by consumerism. If I have an automobile, for example, then I must be cool. If I'm dressed in a certain way, then I must be cool. And people will show evidence, will manifest their admiration and jealousy and show evidence that I am being cool. And if I initiate a divorce for no reason at all, even though, uh, there is no actual issue between John and Peggy, then people will think that I'm cool because I'm a pioneer, because I'm renew renewing, I'm, I'm renovating the institution of, of marriage. So there is this, the voice of the author, the older woman, making fun of a certain group 
in society, a certain group of women in society of which Peg is representative. So John was perfectly in love with Peg and Peg herself is in love with John. John agrees that a plan must be found. Peg doesn't know how they should get divorced and, and uh, she asks him to find uh, ways to help her get that. Assuming that if he's in love, he should grant her a divorce and help her get a divorce. And John's plan is the following. They'll get an automobile, which explains the first line in the novel, John and I are going to get an automobile, a divorce, and, and an automobile, uh, and a divorce and an automobile, and then she adds, actually, I should have said an automobile and a divorce because the automobile would come first. So get is the key there, right? Where the experience of divorcing, the experience of purchase and purchasing an automobile are both classified as purchases, are both classified uh, as uh, fundamental uh, uh, events in the life of a, a consumerist in a society where consumerism defines the basic experience of uh, social being in the upper classes who have enough money to spend time selecting what they want to purchase. So they will get an automobile. They will travel by ship to Naples with the automobile in the cargo of that ship. From Naples, they will drive through central Italy. They will visit the city of Naples. They will travel to Rome. They will visit various places in Umbria, southern Tuscany. They will travel both sides of northern Italy on the Adriatic and the Tyrrhenian Sea. They will go back towards Genoa. They will go to Turin which was an industrial city with a burgeoning automotive industry. From there, they will cross the Alps, go into France, and travel slowly towards Paris. They will never get to Paris. Actually, the conclusion uh, is, is reached uh, before that. But the idea, initially, is that during this journey, she, Peggy, will bring this little book diary where she will enter every instance in which he, her husband, John, has used abusive language or has done something to her that would qualify as evidence to bring in front of a judge to have uh, the dissolution of their marriage legally approved and enforced. So they uh, uh, agree both on this plan. They uh, first uh, spend time uh, picking a car. And, and it's important to find so many pages devoted to the process of purchasing an automobile, including the description of what would have happened at the time, what the experience was like at the time. It's very realistic given the car they buy is an actual uh, car that was being sold at that time and identified the exact uh, model. Uh, they, they get the car, they uh, put it on the ship, they, they travel uh, to Europe, get to Naples, and again, keep in mind, there is no issue between them, no unresolved issue. Right? It's just that on a whim, Peg has decided to get a divorce to show other women that she's an empowered, independent, strong woman. And John has agreed to uh, go along because he thinks that this uh, will just go away at some point. That this is just like a toy for her uh, wife, something that she will play with and then uh, get on with their life. However, on the ship itself, they meet several other characters traveling in first class, going to Italy, and traveling alongside their same path, right? And 
that time you would have found these guides uh, that included preset itineraries taking you to the most famous tourist spots in Italy or France, including some of the more picturesque, out-of-the-way uh, little towns or villages. So the characters they meet who become characters in the rest of the novel, in particular, are Mrs. Baring, who's a widow and a strong, healthy woman, which is important in terms of the contrast with Peggy, because Peggy is the modern kind. Uh, she, she's uh, thin, she, she looks very young, and she's more beautiful. So she's perfect as a lover, not as perfect as potentially a mother, and they have no kids yet, where Mrs. Baring is the perfect woman from the point of view of the standards of the 19th century. Right? A strong woman made, made to bear children as the role of the woman should be in a traditional society. Right? However, Mrs. Baring is also an expert in automobiles. She has purchased this Swiss car called Martini, a company that existed uh, at the time and went on until the 1920s before it disappeared like many others. She knows a lot about the automobiles, as much as John, possibly even more than John. Both John and Mrs. Baring have this passion or obsession for the automobile in common. And so they spend a lot of time, they, they connect over this. And then throughout the rest of the novel, when they're in Naples and wherever in Italy, they meet again in several places, either randomly or because they, uh, set a time, they schedule a meeting in a place in France as well, not just in Italy. Whenever they get together, Mrs. Barron and John spend a lot of time together talking about the car. Both have issues, mechanical issues with their cars. They help each other uh, with technical advice on how to deal with those breakdowns, right, and, and various problems. So. Peggy, through the novels, from the beginning and through the novels, Peggy develops a jealousy, a strong jealousy, an envy also of Mrs. Baring. First of all, as I said, Peg feels threatened by a woman that seems to be perfect according to the traditional standards because she is so healthy, so strong, so decisive, so determined, whereas uh, Peg uh, is, is a, a different kind of woman and has a different temperament altogether. And then there is the issue that Peg knows nothing about the car and cannot really connect to her husband on that. Although by spending time traveling with her husband, she learns uh, about it. So Peg gets into her head that John is uh, um, doubling his efforts to go through with the idea, with the plan of the divorce, whereas Peg, as John had predicted, has doubts about it. The more they go on and the more she realizes that she's doing this for the other women to show off, right? And, and uh, the more she thinks about herself alone, even though John has promised to give her a house and money, uh, the more she feels unhappy about the prospect but at this point, through the novel, she realizes that maybe John will want to get divorced so that he can marry this widow, Mrs. Baring, and that John has found in Mrs. Baring a much better match, a companion, the perfect companion, because they both have this strong attachment to the technology of the automobile. So, peg herself develops her own expertise about the automobile. She tries and tries and, and she uh, works on the car by the time they reach Turin. She's even working on the engine of the car, even though she, she's never, uh, she will never get to the level of Mrs. Baring. And depending on the chapters that you're reading, she's either sad about the 
losing, about losing her husband John to Mrs. Baring or trying to do something about it. Of course, it is a misunderstanding. Of course, John doesn't feel any attachment, any romantic liaison is going on uh, there. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, Mrs. Baring, at the end of the novel, will get married with another character from the ship, the artist Douglas Warwick, who is traveling with them in the company of uh, Miss Gray, who's uh, a, a young, not so young anymore, but not that old woman, not married, who's traveling with them. But the important thing, besides the misunderstandings and besides, of course, all the references to the technology, all the references to consumerism in general as something that supports the development of one's identity in uh, modern society. Uh, what's really interesting is the conclusion of the novel, where uh, in France, before they reach Paris, they have a, a, a Clarification. They have a conversation where uh, um, Peg is saying, I know you want to divorce me. I know you really want to divorce. I don't want a divorce anymore, but you want it more than I do now so that you get married with Mrs. Baring. And he's trying to explain that this is folly, that this is, cannot, cannot be true. Uh, and, and they've just got off the car in the middle of a forest uh, and... Uh, <coughs> Uh, there is a, a, a short mound with rocks and vegetables and uh, uh, she climbs, uh, he follows her, his lips falls back, hits his head and loses consciousness. So she's afraid he's about to die and he has a head trauma and uh, he needs help. So she takes the car and for the first time she has to drive completely by herself. Not only this, but it's essential that she gets to a doctor as quickly as possible to save her husband. She'll manage to do that. She'll manage to save him, to get him to a hospital in time for him to be cured. What's interesting is that this full experience of the car by herself, without her husband, because she, she leaves her husband there, she doesn't want to move him, um, without a doctor allowing him to be moved after uh, the, the, an examination and a first intervention, when she's by herself in the car driving at speed, she's so taken by this experience that even though she's afraid that not only she will lose the husband to the divorce, but that she will lose him because she'll, he'll, he'll die, right? Uh, in spite of this, the experience is exhilarating for her. So the experience of the car is stronger physically and emotionally than the prospect of losing her husband, whom, she's, whom she is very much in love. And in a way, you can summarize the experience, and there is a passage also that confirms that, in a way that she tries to get rid of her husband, she falls back in love with her husband, but by the end of the, love, uh, of the novel, her husband comes second after the automobile. Okay, so that's the extent of the relevancy of the technology in this novel, okay? So let's go through the notes that I placed in this presentation about the novel in general, and if there is time, I will start introducing actual passages for my direct specific commentary of some episodes or the verbiage, the vocabulary used in the novel. Keep in mind, this is, of course, a commercial novel, right? It's entertainment, it's not high literature. We can define it as a light romantic comedy, light because the issues are never really dramatic. With the partial exception of the final scene, where the assumption is that you have to believe that the husband is about to die and that she has to save him 
but you know because you are familiar with the genre as you would know for a film of this kind you know that there is going to be a happy ending right so you're not going to cry about it it's, it's just a little tension that is introduced in the in in the novel as you would find in a rom-com because you know that it would be out of place to have their uh, too strong feel, a feeling, too dramatic, an ending, okay? So all the issues are non-dramatic. They're not really dramatic. They're dramatized by Peg because Peg sees everything in an emphatic way. She exaggerates everything, the good and the bad. And the issues are non-threatening. The marriage is not threatened. His life is not really threatened, etc. And there is this technological twist. The technological twist is, yes, they get back together at the end. She cannot tell him how much she loved the automobile. Because she loved it so much that even though, presumably, from her point of view, he was about to die, she was laughing. She, she was really elated by this experience is more or less a novel that we can place within the genre inaugurated by the lightning conductor of the motor romance. But it's sui generis, right? It's different because it's not two people fall in love because of the automobile, although it seems like they, they're they falling out of love and then falling in love again. But, it, but it's all pretend, it's all theater. But it's more or less within that genre in its widest possible uh, definition, okay? So the crisis is very much intentional, meaning Peg decides we need to have a divorce and she creates this uh, alleged crisis when in fact John remains the same through the novel. And we can call a fashionable crisis because again she wants to be cool she wants to be trendy she wants to be in line with whatever is considered fashionable including divorce or later on the automobile she gets this idea that the automobile makes you more fashionable even than getting a divorce while being young okay and it's built on pride because pride is very much the driving force of the character Peg desperately wants to be admired, desperately wants to be considered successful, wants to be envied by others. And she finds a lot of that in Italy and France, because of course, in a lot of situations there, she's the rich American tourist. And she finds a lot of people from the lower classes in Italy and France who admire her as the wealthy American, who's dressing with uh, elegant clothes, that could never be found in a rural area of central Italy or southern France, right? So all is very convenient in that setting. And we talked about the Minerva, we talked about the plot, and here is a passage that I was referring before, and she's talking about her relationship, and she said, once the motor car would not have figured in it when she would be talking about her relationship with John. Later it was John and motor car, right? She has those elements. At this point, she has developed an attachment with the motor car. Now it appears to be motor car and John. Now the motor car seems to be even more important than John in, in their lives. And so it's not only falling out and back in love with this man, who's of course uh, has, has all the qualities of the romantic hero of the literature of the time or the literature of the late 19th century. John is an older man with a little bit of gray hair, but he is he's strong, he has leadership, he is smart, he is successful in his profession, right? He's admired by others and effortless at that doesn't put in an effort to get other people's admiration, whereas Peggy has to work hard to get other people's admiration. Or at least because she would like to be admired above all, right? And, and never gets there. 
it's also falling in love with this new product, the automobile. So in many ways, this is a consumerist novel and a novelty in the literature at the time at that. Although consumerism was something that was being uh, measured and uh, assessed properly even by newspapers and magazines, right? Because magazines were selling a lot of ads about goods such as clothes, accessories, then cars, etc. But I'm referring, for example, to an article from Great Britain where they say, well, we've noticed that even people from the lower classes will have at least one accessory, one piece of clothing that is out of their range economically. So someone might buy an expensive watch or an expensive pair of gloves or an expensive necktie because of the comfort they derive from that purchase, right? Not because they need it, and certainly it's way too expensive from them, but to have at least one of those items makes them feel higher in society, more important. Uh, it's rewarding for them in a different way. And, and this marks the difference between a pre-consumerist society and a post and a consumerist society, right? At that point, you, you have this kind of new marketing capitalism, right? Based on consumption of products that are not simply utilitarian, not simply necessary, needed, but they satisfy a craving that is authentic in part and very much contrived, produced by marketing, by culture, by literature, theater, films, etc. Now, if you look at the real literature in novels from the 19th century, what you find is that the main characters are often placed in a contrast or a confrontation with figures of authority or institutions or society altogether. That there are big social and political issues in the French, the Italian, the British, uh, uh, novels of the 19th century in this kind of literature that becomes popular at the beginning of the 20th century, the real crisis, the real issues are replaced by personal dilemmas or personal crisis. So it's the self-realization of the character that uh, you find at the foundation of the novel, so there are no big issues to be solved. Society remains the same at the, at the end of the novel that it was at the beginning of the novel, and allegedly the character is different. Is it different really? No. But the character thinks they've changed, right? But there is no evidence of an actual change. It's only small secondary crisis or aspects of their life that are being redefined by the end of the novel. And this is still true of most films that uh, you see on TV streaming or you go see on a theater today, that there are no, not many films about big social and political issues <coughs> and, not, and, and not many films about big personal crisis and the changes be between the beginning and the end of the movie for a character are really minimal when, when you look at them uh, closely, uh, right? Um, everything is expressed in a very theatrical style, meaning that you don't find long internal speeches by the characters about their emotional world. It's mostly what the characters say and do that can be seen by others, that is the foundation, the basis for the narrative. And don't forget, that there is a constant use of irony in the novel, so don't take it too seriously. John is not taking Peg seriously, the author, Louise, is not taking her seriously, and sometimes is making fun of her. Altogether, we can talk about, for this period, an Atlantic literature, which also Edwardian literature from, the, uh, from King Edward, who uh, was the king of England after Victoria. And 
inside this Edwardian literature, you find a lot of irony, plenty of references to culture, and in spite of the fact that Peg has not studied past high school, she, seemed to, she seems to be cultured enough, right? That is the culture of the author that uh, um, finds its way in the pages of the novel. Um, this kind of light tone is typical of Edwardian literature. This kind of individual crisis or issues is also typical. But then from the social point of view, Inside these novels, you find a lot of characters from the upper classes or middle upper classes, characters who are financially independent, who are not subject to the authority of a family. Peggy has a mother. The mother is mentioned at the beginning of the novel in the first few pages, rarely mentioned after that, never appears as a character, right? And... Uh, she doesn't work, so she doesn't have a boss, but even her husband, who's working, makes no mention of a boss, of an office where there could be a hierarchy, right? They travel to Italy, where they're not subject to any hierarchy. They're tourists. So they're in this kind of social limbo, right? They're not integrated into Italian society, therefore they cannot be required to follow all the rules. If they don't follow the rules of the locals, people will just say, well, they're Americans. And they are not forced to follow the rules of American society because they're in Italy. And so they can pretend to be more than they are. For example, at some point they're in an inn having dinner and they pretend that they're much wealthier than they are by showing a church in New England with a bell tower saying that is the tower of our mansion, right? Because, of course, the innkeeper is a simple man from central Italy who's never been to the U.S., who, who doesn't, cannot distinguish a Protestant church from a northeastern man mansion uh, because all they've seen are Italian villas or regular people's houses in their area, okay? Um, there is this impression that there is an infinite possibility, an infinite potential for mobility, right? There is this hopeful view of life that this is just the beginning and we'll do better and much better than is typical of these novels. And possibly the reason why people were reading this, it's consolatory. Right? You, it's comforting to read about other people having manageable problems and then becoming successful. And, and that formula has been repeated for the next hundred years as well. There is a typical Anglo vibe in this novel. Um, it's, it's Edwardian literature also because, yes, it's about emotion. But even love and similar emotions are never overpowering, never wild. God forbid uh, there is a, a, a reference to any erotic desire instinct, to the point where through the novel you see many references to the fact that when Peg and John get to a hotel in Italy, a small pensione even, they sleep in separate bedrooms, right? So everything is very proper. And even when Peg is distraught, allegedly, over the idea, the fear of losing her husband, she's always also controlled somewhat, always composed in her reaction with some very minor deviation that are for the most part funny, not scandalous, right? She, she will wander uh, out of her bedroom one night to look at the list of ships departing, departing from Genoa to the US because she wants to abandon the trip because she thinks she cannot um, make, make up with John anymore, that the divorce will be final and there is no point in following him to France, and when she's wandering out of her bedroom in her nightdress, she finds a 
night watch, a, a staff of the hotel who's the nocturnal guard, right? And, and so it, it's kind of scandalous, but in a very Victorian way. For the most part, there is a lot of emotional detachment. They talk about love, but it's a theatrical love, right? No physical passion, no wild emotions there. And mostly, I call it emotional math. It's about, am I happier? Am I less happy? So what, that is what Peg is doing day after day, chapter after chapter, measuring how happy she, uh, she, she feels uh, or, or how much romance there is in her life, how much excitement. But again, it's controlled excitement, right? Um, and, and everything happens by dosing those themes, right? Without a big crisis, without a big twist, without a big event, as you would have found in a 19th century novel, okay? So the idea is that you take reality and reality is chaotic, right? And how do you provide solace? How do you provide comfort to the reader? You give them a situation which looks like reality because there are some of the same elements, but in fact, it's controlled chaos. You've removed so many aspects, right? Uh, the real life problems. Yes, they, they, they have food and, and they sleep, but they don't have issues with money, issues with work, issues with society, authority, etc. So it's comforting to immerse yourself in this uh, situation where all the problematic elements of life have been reduced or eliminated and the other aspects become easier to deal with. But again, this is the algorithm. This is a formula for films even today or for big literary success, Dan Brown or Fifty Shades, etc. Right? It's subtracting from life all the elements that would interfere with uh, the situation. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the SNL skit uh, about Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, of Grey when the Dakota Fanning went there, about a group of workers making all the torture uh, elements in the playroom of, uh, uh, of the man, Mr. Steele, right? Uh, at, and that is exactly bringing reality because if you place the story in real life, it becomes ridiculous, right? And once you have that element, who built the playroom? And what were they thinking? And were they discussing how many dildos they should have in this room or how the sex swing should be uh, uh, angled, etc. cetera? And, and once you place that, it becomes funny right away. So if you haven't seen it, you can quickly find it, uh, and, and it's one of those where SNL is still funny. Okay, so yes, there is the illusion of change. The characters are in transition, right? At the beginning, they are, but it's not like they found their balance at the end. It's an easy transition. It's an easy change, right? It's like those American movies where someone is doing badly at the university and then within 15 days they're star students and their semester is done, it's fixed just because they've studied uh, for a couple of weeks. Wow, right? Never works that way in real life, at least not for most people, uh, most of you or, or uh, me uh, in, in my experience, right? And then if you don't have the big issues, society, authority, politics, the economy, what do you focus on? You focus on behaviors, right? Uh, what people have done to you, how they behave, the small ethical issues that become epic, they become central. And, and that is typical of entertainment. And the best demonstration would be the success of Kirby enthusiasm where the smallest issues become uh, uh, replace the biggest issues in terms of the concerns, right? And, and it is Larry David making fun of our society where we're not able to discuss the big issues anymore 
and then we focus just on what someone did at dinner or in a message or during a quick encounter and you talk and talk and talk about nothing. So there are several places with providing a context for the story and a set of rules that goes with every place. So the Minerva Club has its set of rules that she, Peggy, has to conform to in order to become successful, to get noted. There is the couple's home in the first few chapters in New Jersey, got a wealthy home and they have servants. They talk about it, even though they're not presented on the page. They go on a steamship, and of course it's first class with its crowd and its conversations and rules. Then you have the new context, and the new context is the car, because the car is a place where you spend a lot of time, so it becomes a theatrical stage of sorts, a platform, and the car itself becomes a character. So all of that is very new. You have Italy, and Italy is exploited as an exotic place, as I said before. It's a place where rules don't apply to them, where they can reinvent their se themselves, where they can experience anarchy and freedom in a quick and, and painless way, right? It's, it is much more difficult to, to be a rebel at home, in your society, or within your family, but if you go to Italy and you're an American, nobody knows you, then you can do, can do whatever you, you want, right? So uh, people probably would never play soccer in front of St. Patrick in New York City, but American tourists leave beer bottles in, in front of St. Peter in Rome, right? Because they're there and, and there they can feel free, right? Liberated. And of course, Italy is the place commonly associated, stereotypically associated with the idea of the chaotic passion, the passion that takes you, right? But it's just at the background. The characters never experience that, right? But you feel like, yes, maybe this excitement will take me. Maybe I'll be contaminated by, by this, okay? This was notes that I used in the past, so we talked about John and Peggy, but John is aligned with Mrs. Baring. They represent the future because they're both car nuts. They're obsessed with cars and cars, car experts. And then Peggy, who represents the past together with Miss Gray, Mrs. Gray, uh, uh, actually it's Miss Gray, and Douglas Warwick, Peggy will move into the future aligning herself with John with the passion of the automobile. And Peggy and Douglas represent the past. They are creative characters. They uh, try to conform to the romantic ideas of love. It's only at the end that Peggy will change, falling in love with the automobile, right? Uh, Miss Gray is herself old-fashioned. She falls in love with the artist. By the end, the artist will marry Mrs. Baring because she, being a strong woman, can take care of him, who's an artist, and therefore carefree, uh, not concerned with material things, small things like eating or changing your shirt if it is stained, etc. There is this idea that motorists, people who are carnats like John and Mrs. Baring, are part of a new tribe. So you are in or out of that tribe, of that clan. Also, the idea which you find developed in other books from the period that cars themselves are like different species, that cars produce different effects on people. It's interesting how you can see the journey from southern Italy, Naples, to the north of Italy, Turin, to France, as a journey that is representative of a transition from the past to the new technological future because southern Italy is represented as a place that is atavic. Atavism was something mentioned by Charles Darwin, the origins, origin of the species, Darwin said, the same way that species that survive tend to change, there are also traits that appear in any species, in an animal from a species, 
that are representative of what that species was generations before. Okay, so in any species, there are variations at both sides of the spectrum, variations that will be seen predominant in the future of that species, and variations that will never be dominant, but will reappear from time to time that represent the heritage of that species. Okay? And clearly, Italy, southern Italy, a place uh, dominated by passions where murder can happen out of simple jealousy represents that kind of atavistic society rooted in the past, right? That cannot evolve, that cannot be the model for the future. And, and when they get to Turin, in Turin they find the future, they find an industrialized city, a city that has modified itself, that is full of representative of the new tribe of the automobile owners and drivers, and France socially is more advanced, represented as more civilized than southern Italy, and of course there are plenty also of reference to the car in France. Just to give you a bit of a context, because these things have changed so much in the last 120 years, during the 19th century, a successful British archaeologist and writer was George Dennis, who published several uh, um, editions of a book called Cities and Cemeteries of Etruria. He went to Tuscany not only to, to dig out uh, Etruscan artifacts, but he went there convinced that the material evidence found in the ground was matched by the anthropological evidence that if you studied the people in Tuscany in certain places that were remote enough, isolated enough, not influenced by modern society and civilization, by progress, by industrialization, in the faces of the people, in their practices, in their social customs, you would have found evidence of their Etruscan past. And this conviction, which of course uh, uh, will be reinforced by the social interpretations of the books by Darwin, you can find in a traveler by the end of the century, but a contemporary of Louis Closser Hale, practically, George Hewlett, uh, Maurice Hewlett, who went to Tuscany several times, wrote several books, including The Road in Tuscany, and he was looking exactly for those kinds of places, remote places in the Tuscan Apennines, where you could see evidence that people were the true, authentic, pristine descendants of their ancestors from a thousand, two thousand years before. Okay, so this idea of atavism was really ingrained in the culture of the time. This this contrast between resistance to evolution and development, the past and the future. And the future, in Darwinian terms, is a place where technology is represented everywhere in the human scape, in the urban landscapes, and therefore either you adapt to it, convert to the technology, become fluent with the technology, or you cannot survive socially, right? You cannot move in society, you cannot be successful, etc. This is the beginning, let me comment on a few passages uh, and in the meantime, I will also circulate the attendance. First line, John and I are going to get a divorce and an automobile. Where get is the verb that can be used for everything from a legal and social thing such as divorce and an actual product such as the automobile. Keegan. Is there a reason why there's no like, quotation marks around the, around the sentences? Because I feel like it would be a little bit of It's Peg's voice, right? She's telling the story. And at the end of the, of the book, it will be John from the hospital bed after finally they've come to the complete clarification of their pseudo issues that were never really threatening the solidity of their relationship. He says, maybe you should... First they talk about the diary where she was supposed to enter evidence for their divorce, 
they open that diary and it's empty. And she hasn't entered anything into it. He took hold of the book at some point, but shows her that the only thing he entered there were how much money he spent on gasoline mm -hmm. during the trip. Okay, so Peg is telling the story following the recommendation of John, who at the end says, well, maybe you should tell the story and the story will be instructive, uh, etc." So she's happy, right? Finally changing my life. I'm transitioning. I'm transacting because I'll have two things that are considered to be cool right now. A divorce, but not a divorce because of issues. A divorce driven by the desire to be a strong, independent woman, and an automobile, which is the uh, most desirable uh, product of consumption because one of the most expensive and also one that is difficult to operate because you have to learn so many things in order to be driving an automobile. Okay? So, it's, the exaggeration is palpable in this kind of statement and in many others by Peg. Right? And she explains that, etc., etc. We would not be able to get the divorce without the, the, the machine. That tells you the connection between identity and consumption, right? So the automobile is who I am as much as the divorce. Right? Although it shouldn't be on the same level, they are placed at the same level in terms of values, in terms of impact on the life of, of the character. And naturally, I'm a little excited over these purchases, the idea that even before you get something that is the basis of consumption, you dream about your life and how your life will be different once you finally get the iPhone 14, which is so vastly different from the iPhone 12 you might have had before, or, or any other phone, etc., etc. Um, and then here she mentions it, it's sometimes the style it's a bit complicated. The syntax can be so. The style is always indirect, but when she says. I wish to make myself quite clear that injustice may not done me by those who have little understanding of a new thought, dito woman. The new thought, the new way of thinking, the way of thinking of the new woman, the feminist way of thinking, is what drives her. And anyone who criticizes her has limited understanding of what feminism is about. Okay, that's the meaning of these two lines, which have become harder to read for the modern reader, when in fact uh, references to the New One movement populated the press, the journals, the newspapers of the time uh, constantly. Although, again, mostly it was the feminism, the proto-feminism of middle to upper class women and mostly upper-class women, so of women who already were enjoying uh, a certain degree of freedom. Okay. And, and she talks about her mother, and her mother considered her someone who was a spoiled brat, who didn't know how to put bread on, butter on her bread, meaning that, that she couldn't do anything without help, that she was not really independent. Uh, but the point of view of the mother is also the point of view of the author of Louise, right? Okay. And she explains how she got married, and I mentioned that already. And to give you, from the very beginning, you and the reader, a sense of how small this crisis really is, yes, they're, they're talking about divorce, but she'll be comfortable, she will live in their place in New Jersey, uh, and and uh, it'll be an agreeable divorce, etc. At the same time, you see how she watches her language, saying, well, I shouldn't say automobile, I should say motor car, because that's what they say in England, and English society during this period is considered fashionable, a model of elegance, right? And then 
she talks about her experiences uh, and, and the broad, broadening of her view of life through her uh, experiences, uh, knowing all kinds of people, but in fact, the irony is present in the rest of the paragraph, whereby in the rest of the paragraph you see that she's not really interacting on an equal footing with other people that she considers herself superior, that uh, she, she wants to keep a distance from anyone who is not uh, uh, in her circle or her uh, class. She talks about paying for Bibles to be placed in hotels called Rain's Law Hotels, and I've added links to explain these references. Uh, it, on, on Sunday in several American states, it was prohibited to drink uh, alcohol uh, in uh, places uh, uh, that offered so, but there were hotels where you could rent a room and spend time drinking there with your friends. And that was legal. Uh, and you may remember if you've seen, for example, the latest iteration of The Great Gatsby with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, you remember that they go to the city and they take a room and drink in there. That is why that happens in the novel and the film, okay? because of these laws prohibiting the consumption of alcohol in public places on Sundays, but you circumvent that by renting a room. Okay. Here she talks about George Meredith and his theory of the marriage clause. And this is when she's challenged and someone says, while the others are celebrating her, someone says, why don't you demonstrate? And at that point, she has to execute her plan. But in order to, even in order to get divorced, she has to go to her husband and seduce him and uh, persuade him to help her get a divorce. So it's clear that it is a, a game. That's the description of their plan. Buy a good American machine, take it to Naples with us, drive it through Italy and France, clear up to Cherbourg in Normandy, or some such port on our return trip home. I'm to accompany him and keep a diary in which I am to register our daily bickerings. There are many, or not substantial. And when the time comes, bring it into court as evidence against him, which he will not deny. So he will not oppose their divorce. From the beginning, when the plan is made, Peg is worried that having an automobile will make it more difficult to divorce. Because she realizes that automobiles have a funny effect on couples, on people. They have an effect on your nervous system. So she talks about this couple, the Haverleys, how they go around and she sits next to her husband who's driving, but she wants to toot the horn, right? The cars of the period had a horn, not an electrical devices to, to uh, emit a sound. Um, she, she behaves in this childish way because she wants to be seen in the car. They, they argue, but when they get off the car, You, they, they start billing and cooing as soon as they get out of the auto. So the car seems to be a hindrance rather than the instrument to facilitate their divorce uh, to the point where she says, if there is a judge who has a wife and a car, then he'll understand that our divorce is groundless because part of what we feel is being modified by the condition of being on a car. Okay, I'll stop here because it's a good point to stop. If you need my help, I'll be in my office until 5.30 as usual. I'm on Zoom Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoons. And you can quickly make a, an appointment for a Zoom meeting by using the Calendly link that you find in our calendar and the syllabus 